Can you repeat that about the athletes? Athletes who work harder in pre-season will perform better in season. Job so, hunters out there, <laughs> are you listening to that? What so, have I been telling yeah. you? Plus, it's a sports analogy, it which I love, as it you is. know. <laughs> it is. But Excellent. I mean, it's the same as starting a new job the, the, yes. or starting a new life. This is a new life. If you're coming to a new country, there's an element of transformation. And transformation involves change. It yes. involves changing every not every element but you will leave certain things behind you'll take certain things forward to make room for new things to come in you can't be the full you and keep piling more stuff on because you'll just bury yourself in it Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. A few weeks ago, I interviewed my friend Mohit Bhagava to talk to you about his career as a chief marketing officer and a senior marketing professional in Australia. Mohit moved to Australia as a 17-year-old from India with his family and graduated from La Trobe University as a graduate from the business faculty. His career has been absolutely fantastic. He has worked for some of the most iconic organizations in Australia. He has held senior marketing roles in the entertainment business and was recognized by his peers as one of the top 50 chief marketing officers in Australia two years in a row. Most recently, he was Chief Marketing Officer of Big Four, a network of holiday parks that are located throughout Australia. And during his time in the company, Big Four announced a partnership with The Wiggles, which wherever you are in the world, if you know kids, you may know The Wiggles. They are an Australian children's music group and they're famous worldwide. He was previously the General Manager of Sales and Marketing at Village Entertainment, Village Entertainment is a subsidiary of Village Roadshow Limited, an Australian company which operates cinemas, theme parks and produces and distributes films in Australia. He also worked as a senior digital marketer at Nova Entertainment and that one is an Australian entertainment company that operates radios, a paid TV channel and mobile brands. So as you can see, these are very strong businesses in the entertainment sector. But, you know, Mohit almost didn't stay in Australia. When he graduated from La Trobe Business Faculty, he received from his mentor the advice to go back home to India. And that was really a sliding doors moment for him. And thank goodness he stayed. Because as somebody in a senior leadership role in marketing in Australia, he was able to use that expertise in the entertainment and hospitality industry to enhance those businesses marketing around families, deal with the disruption in those sectors and improve those brands approach to multicultural marketing. He is about to start a new role in Southeast Asia, which we're not supposed to announce, so we'll be quiet for now. But when we're able to announce it, we will. So follow us on our Facebook page. We have a private Facebook group for job hunters and career enthusiasts. So if you're really serious about your career development, you might want to join us in that private Facebook group, which is a place where you can feel safe sharing questions and ideas about career development. And I also have a newsletter to my followers and my community. And there is a link in the episode show notes that you can tap on it and subscribe to the newsletter so that you will receive these podcasts weekly, as well as a curated list of articles about career development and any news that I have for you, such as where Mohit will be working next. I started this podcast episode with Mohit in a very different way. I decided not to edit out the 
chit chat that we had at the beginning. It's very casual the way that we start conversations when I start talking to my guests. And I decided just to leave this one here for you so that you can feel like a fly on the wall as we start getting ready for our chat. And just to make it easier for you, if you want to skip ahead, I have decided to do timestamps to guide you in your listening. So you can move forward and skip to listen to Mohit's story about his graduation day and the advice that he received that day. And then after that, he will talk about his first job and how he found it through networking and then how he uses LinkedIn, which was a question that I had for him because his profile is just so, so good. And I was so impressed. Then there is his three step philosophy to succeeding in a new country, which I think will be a very good listen to anyone that comes from overseas like myself doesn't matter if you come from overseas and you're in a different country. It doesn't have to necessarily be Australia. If you are an international student, a migrant or an expat, it would be wonderful for you to listen to his philosophy of how you arrive, grow and propel in a different country. He will talk also to you about his leadership mindset and how he's getting ready for his new role in a new country and a new organization. So look at the episode show notes for those timestamps, as well as any links that we mentioned and links to my services and my website. And of course, to sign up for the newsletter, as I said before. So without further ado, here is my friend Mohit, and I hope you enjoy this chat. Bye for now. Doing podcast you can hear them complaining about the heat in the studio <laughs> and I often hear also people joking about um, being in the, inside a wardrobe or inside a closet mm -hmm. especially during COVID times I listen a lot to Mia Freeman and the yes. Mamma Mia yeah, ladies yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're always you know talking about where they are and <laughs> noises outside it's quite yeah, funny yeah. Mike, you can hear the kids running around yeah yeah so how what's your what's your okay what are your goals out of this so i have that in the back of my mind okay so this podcast is for job hunters okay and for people that are interested in their careers and their mm. career progression mm. okay it, i'm very interested in the stats for the podcast and i'm always surprised i had no idea that it was going to be listened in as many countries as it is so it's mm. 50 plus countries at the moment wow and the podcasts tend to spike when they're launched. So they get like a few hundred views mm. during the week that they're mm. launched. But they live forever and they mm. don't age really because sure. it's career related um, yeah. uh, topics. Yeah. And we did have a COVID series. Yes. But I think even the COVID series, which is about VUCA world, about uh, finding jobs during turbulent times. Yeah. And preparing for catastrophic things to happen in your life. We had this very interesting guy who is an economist and a um, behavior scientist talking about feeling, uh, getting ready for uh, disasters. Yes. And um, we had the, sort of those things that were very COVID related, but mm. applicable at other times as well. Yeah. So I think all of the episodes keep turning on on iTunes and Spotify or wherever people find them. And really the first few episodes, which were about brand and narrative mm. and communicating your pitch to employers and hiring managers, those are still the most popular ones. And I think I needed to get them out of my chest. <laughs> you know? mm. These were things that were in my head for years, you know, sure. and I just needed to get them out of my chest. They mm. were very low tech and they they did really well great so now i've been more interested in using the podcast to interview people like you mo sure because it adds a different flavor every week to the I audience i have people that are following the podcast mm. i send a newsletter to hundreds of people every week to let them know that there's a new episode yeah. available how many and episodes have you got now now 35 and how many guys? How many what? Guys on the any of you interview oh, or girls? Good question. You would be the 
fifth guy. Okay. Yes. Yep. Fifth guy, I think. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I think that that's what it is. And <coughs> I do have more ladies interviewed so far, but I have a few guys coming up. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's good. Mm. Um, hopefully, you know, uh, it will be good to have 50-50. As I mean, it also depends forward. on your audience, right? To an extent. Well, my audience, even if we have more women, which mm. I don't know, because oh, you it don't get that show, data. Yeah. I have, I have to say, they they will still work with men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> and be hired with uh, their male company. I mean, it's almost and, like you need that. Yes. Even, yeah, yeah, you need that even keel because it can become. You don't want it to be the Mamma Mia of job hunting podcasts. No, no, yeah. not really. I, uh, at one point I did think that I was going to be the career coach that support women, mm. but I think I'm more the career coach that support people that are in their mid to late thirties onwards. I understand what it feels to be at that point in your career where you feel that you're stuck in a rut that you don't know how to progress any further yeah and that can happen to men and women mm -hmm. you know and also i've been made redundant sure i've had to that vulnerable all the vulnerability I, yeah, that yeah. vulnerability i actually listened to that podcast i think yeah it happens to both and i have clients you know <laughs> that are men and women and they sure. I, I feel like I, I help them both and I can't help everybody I think mm. I will click with a few people more yeah. than I there has to be chemistry as a coach right? yes yeah. what I do is if I feel that I'm not the right coach for a specific client I mm. will refer them to someone, someone else. else and sometimes you know what I refer them to lawyers mm. because sometimes you don't need a coach you need legal advice <laughs> <laughs> right. and maybe you need a coach to tell you that maybe yeah. you don't see it yourself mm. but mm. you probably do need legal advice and that's fine too you know it's yeah. part of the deal I mean you were um, a senior exec you know that you know some of the packages and proposals that we get are complex yes. and they've been written with several hands and mm. you're just one person yeah. Why not get the advice that you need to before you lock in a deal or exit an organization, right? So. Completely makes sense. So let's talk about your career now. Happy to do it. Okay. Yep. So I'll be led by your questions, right? I, so. I want to start by <clears throat> talking about your graduation day. Sure. And the fact that you did not attend the graduation day. Well, I sort of did. Yes. Um, yeah. Explain. Explain what happened that day. Um, okay. So look, I my graduation day, I was I was present, but in a different capacity. So I was actually working at the function hall on campus, um, serving drinks and, and canapes to graduating students, so my fellow classmates and uh, and their families, which at the time I thought was a pretty smart way of kind of attending the graduation because I was getting paid and I didn't have to sit through the entire ceremony which for a 21 year old can be a bit cumbersome but what I had planned was a celebratory drink with with a close mentor of mine when I'd fin when I was going to finish my shift which was just downstairs at the university bar now this mentor has had been somebody very close, very encouraging over the last four odd years of campus life, and and I, I frankly give him a lot of credit for for all the for all the small achievements and and challenges that I took on in that time. But we were gonna you know we were gonna sit down over a drink and talk about what I do next, what options should I explore, and and as we started discussing the prospects, you know his I think his 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 response somewhat shocked me uh, to be honest. Because it was very, very single-minded in the in the notion that I should pack up my bags and and return to India, and I, you know, as much as I was taken aback, I knew that he meant well. He's been somebody that I've known for years, and uh, and and he has my best interest at heart. Um, so I took that advice. I somewhat slept on it. Um, I I woke up, thanked him for that advice, reconnected, but. It was up to me at that point to really make a big decision in life, you know. Is this, is this the time for me to still take on this individual's advice or am I ready to make up my own mind and take on a different direction? So I chose to take on a different direction and stay on. 
And perhaps I was young and idealistic, I don't know. But, uh, but frankly, um, I think there's two elements to that that really stuck out. One was, you know, the advice that was provided to me was based on another person's opinion of Australia at the time and how they saw the country. And they're from, they were from a different background, a different age to where I sat. And look, looking back 15 years on, I think even longer now, I'm proud of what Australia is today and, and the opportunities that I have been given. Uh, and, and not just given, I have earned those opportunities as well. But uh, yeah, so that was, that was graduation day. It was quite a, quite a memorable one for me, uh, wow. but for different reasons. Yes. That's very interesting because you were very young and you had to take that advice and I was, were you heartbroken? Was that a heartbreaking thing to listen to? Sincerely, no, no? Uh, not because I'm actually, I was more heartbroken about it just a few months ago when I was invited back to the university to speak at a commencement speech. And I chose to talk about this story, which I actually have not shared with many people for several years. And because I think I'm now at a point where, you know, you've had enough life experience to realize what that kind of advice can mean to someone at that age. I don't think I was, my emotional maturity probably wasn't at a point where I could truly understand the depth and level of that advice at that time. I just figured that, hey, that's your point of view. So be it. Um, yeah. And I'm just going to press on. Yes. And then you went on to become one of the top 50 chief marketing officers in Australia. Not only that, but managing some of the most iconic brands in Australia in, you know, Big Four, Village, Nova. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. Do you still, are you still connected with that person? Is that person still in your network? Um, was for a few years yeah. and then we've just lost touch, to be honest. Um, you know, he's, uh, yeah, we, we just lost touch. So what do you think happened there? What, how, it had, was he not in keeping with the times or were you so ambitious and excited about your career? What opened the doors for you to enable you to achieve that? Um, look, all of my, um, you know, you can only join the dots backwards. I wish I could, you know, tell you the formula, but I can share my experiences and I hope they help. Um, so how I got my first job, right? It was, it was, it was unconventional. I, um, I had applied for some graduate programs and, and uh, you know, I got some interviews, but I wasn't very successful uh, in that process. But all at the same time, I was still bartending and working at the same union hall that we mentioned. And as it happened, I got my first job off the back of serving a drink. Um, and that came back to just showing interest in other people. Uh, this, in, this gentleman rocked up to the bar. He was very well dressed and he certainly didn't look like an academic. So he, he stuck out a bit in a university campus. Mm. And he ordered a, uh, he ordered a beverage, um, you know, uh, a Jim Beam and Coke. And it was still daylight and no one on campus orders those sort of drinks in, in, unless it's Friday and, and, you know, there's a big university party. Um, and, and it wasn't busy, so I just chose to ask the question. I was like, what brings you to the campus? I haven't seen you here before, and so on and so forth. And it turned out that this gentleman was the marketing director for Jim Beam Bourbon in Australia. No wonder he was drinking Jim Beam during yeah, the day. Yeah, so he had, a, you know, he had a sort of, you know, sort of brand in hand mantra, yeah. if you like. And, uh, and, you know, and we just got talking. And he was, he was at the time surveying Australian campuses with the prospect of building a, a, a brand marketing program to promote the brand across campus bars in Australia. Mm. And, and we really struck a chord, you know, because I'd lived on campus. I understood campus life very well. I was the president of a student club. Um, I obviously understood uh, bar life on campus. I was working there. I'd studied marketing. So we, you know, we, we really felt that there was chemistry and he generously gave me his business card and said, hey, you know, get in touch if you, once you've finished and if you're looking for other, other opportunities and so forth. And, you know, and, and, and I chose to make a phone call a couple of weeks later and I just said, hey, why not? You know, and, and, I, and I, I must admit, you know, at that age, sometimes you just don't even see the opportunity. So I was glad that I made that phone call. And mm. then that was, that was that. A few months later, I was part of building a, a campus marketing program for a global beverage company. And, and I did that for about three years. Um, that was my graduate role. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a traditional, 
opportunity per se, but I think the key takeaway for me from that experience is that showing curiosity in other people can lead to very special outcomes for yourself. So mm. um, the first thing in job hunting, and I think looking back, I've learned this, is you have to be astute in listening to what other people, the, what is the problem that people want to hire you to solve? And if you can position yourself in a way as a solution to that problem, you'll be f very effective in, yeah. in, in selling yourself in. So I think the first element is listening and showing curiosity. And, and that put me in good stead, you know, from there I spent some years in ad agencies and, and, and then an opportunity came, in to, came up to join Nova. That was a big national media organization which was going through a digital transformation. So I took the opportunity to, to learn on the job and, and, and build my digital skills. I was, you know, I was one of the few in the organization that sort of, you know, really took that on and and, 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 and honed in on the digital side and took on some digital specific roles, which, which again, helped round me out because I came from a traditional brand marketing, you know, background in a beverage company, events, sponsorship, and so forth. And then moving into media, uh, comms, and then taking on digital. So I was constantly trying to ensure that, you know, my skills were relevant. I was, I was engaged in my industry and my craft and I knew what was in demand and, I would proactively find reasons to to take on an opportunity if it yeah. came up at work, um, and yeah, and look, you know, I, after Nova, I, I took a year off. I got married. I travelled around the world, which was the best education. I think that was the true MBA in terms of understanding cultures and people and, and consumer psychology. And then I came back, and um, and then joined Village, and mm -hmm. and it's a, another fantastic organisation, and uh, moved into into you know large format uh scaled out of home entertainment uh, asset management so cinemas theme parks and so forth is the portfolio of the business that was fantastic because that opened me up to a different lens on understanding the, the pulse of the public you know the box office in a country can tell you a lot about the sentiment, the tastes, the choices of of, of a people at large, right? And and that's where I think wasn't as a uh, you know as someone who's migrated to Australia, um, I speak more than one language. I really started to understand the shift that's occurring in Australia, and that was to do more with how the box office is changing. Um, you know, there were certain titles. Um, let me think of one that I can you know. How people uh, would would respond to oh, different movies? Of course. I mean, look, you know, we were seeing, this is going back a few years now, but, you know, Australia's cinema market is fairly mature. It grows at about 2% a year. That's a good year. But we were seeing Bollywood grow at 28 to 30% a year. Of course. Right. So that's a growth opportunity. How yes. do we actually optimize to that? We were also seeing uh, genre movements, you know. Um, so, for instance, a film like Straight Outta Compton, which uh, which is a very American story about African American culture and the struggle and so forth, you know, 15 years ago in Australia would be deemed quite niche, as you know, it would not appeal to 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 mass audiences. Per capita, when the film was released a couple of years ago, we actually over-indexed in in box office performance on that film wow. so you can see the tastes of the general public change but beneath that if you really start peeling the onion what you're seeing is that the market is changing the makeup of the market we're a far more diverse society uh, people relate and connect to different st stories you know uh, a struggle of a minority group no matter their race is relatable to several other minority groups so you you know we, we were getting I think that was a great time to really unpack what is occurring in Australia from a uh, cultural diversity standpoint and how it actually impacts mass entertainment businesses. And you can use that information to then recycle it and you use optimize it to your retail yeah, mix, right? Exactly. And I mean, I think you see that now in 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 grocery, how different outlets and in the major major grocery stores operate and so forth. So you know. Uh, by and large, big business in Australia is still reacting um, to the change. A lot of businesses still don't get it. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's been the journey. I mean, in, in terms of, and then, then of course, big four holiday parks came up, which yes. was, uh, which was again, you know, a very quintessential Aussie brand, caravanning and camping, and um, you know, 
they, they sell a great proposition, which is about encouraging Australian families to take a great Aussie break. And, and it's very relevant in today's, today's times, which allowed me to venture into tourism and, and accommodation and leisure, which was another genre of entertainment, if you like. And I, and I fundamentally, the reason, one of the reasons for, for taking that opportunity on was because I felt that Aussie families and what defines an Aussie family is changing and there's a real opportunity to work with a, another great Australian brand to redefine that and how we actually evolve our view and, and become more inclusive. Because, you know, there's, there's, there's still brands and, and the country at large, we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that the lifestyle and the proposition that we offer as brands is truly inclusive. Yes. Uh, I mean, just recently I saw a, uh, a brand that, um, you know, was the, it's a great iconic Australian brand and they were talking about, you know, how, uh, to, you know, they wanted to hire the, a, a brand manager, but they, one of the selection criteria, and I know, I know it, was, is that it was done in, in good faith. That's but it the was, one I sent you. Yes, that's right. Oh, and, and, uh, okay. But, you know, the, the selection criteria <laughs> said we're looking... I sent you to get your, your opinion on yeah, it. Yeah, and, and I must admit, you know, since, you've, since you shared that, I, I, I've been pondering on it, and it, the selection criteria on that was, you know, one of the selection criteria was we're looking for a true blue Aussie. Now, I know and you know that you know a brands do that sort of stuff sometimes just to have a bit of fun because yes. that's but for a lot of people uh, that that might seem that oh that's not me mm. you know but they may have the perfect skill set for it so so I think there's a there's a there's a level of brand awareness and, and work that still needs to be done in that element uh, but I, I think I'm digressing. Going back to the journey no, that no, I'm that's on. that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's been my my journey so far. When I I think LinkedIn is very telling of someone's personal brand, mm. and when I looked at our shared connections, because you have a lot of connections, I have a lot of connections. When I look at our shared connections, what we share is a whole bunch of amazing marketing people. Yes. and a whole bunch of amazing diversity and inclusion professionals. I think that that's, would you say that that's where your branding lies in terms of how you see yourself as a, you know, that top CMO mm -hmm. that understands diversity and how to incorporate that and embed that in an organization that still needs support with it? Look, I think, the short answer is yes. That is certainly a tool in my toolkit that I bring to the table when when I when I join an organisation or a cause. It has been nurtured over time, and and also quite frankly, that has that is my authentic journey from birth up until now. So, it's not something that I have to try very hard to grasp. It's just mm. part of who I am. Yeah. And there's there's different businesses and different needs. So in some instances that tool is required more so than in other instances. So I'm not by any means, you know, um, a marketer that over, you know, just solely and wholly relies on one aspect of, of reinvigorating brands and businesses, but where it's required, absolutely. It's a very dominant element of future-proofing brands. We have seen what's happened to Holden in this country. Yeah. We have seen a lot of iconic Australian brands, you know, that have struggled to reinvent themselves to suit contemporary Australia. Uh, because they have somehow felt that they need to hold their core audience, uh, you know, they, 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 they are the ones that really need to work through this challenge more so than others because it's, you know, Australia is changing. The, the, the population mix is changing and will continue to change whether we like it or not. And look, that's just an economic assessment of your business. Whether Where you stand on it from a personal standpoint is, is really not my concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as a business and as a marketer, that's 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 a very that's a critical element of being successful in marketing in Australia today. Yeah, that's a good answer. When I talking about LinkedIn, because in my coaching business we're a bit obsessed with LinkedIn at the moment because <laughs> we have nothing else to obsess about. Right. As you know, we can't go out and have meetings. There is no mm. workplace for us to gossip and network, and no conferences, nothing. Mm. So LinkedIn is where people bump into each other sure. these days. So I was looking at your profile and it's perfect. I'm like, I can't use that word perfect anymore because we've interviewed Lynn Kazali and she wrote a book about 
not not needing to be perfect but it's very good <laughs> your Thank profile you. is really really well done i notice you don't post or publish much but you like and comment a lot mm -hmm. how do you use linkedin to is it is this is linkedin part of your networking toolkit or are you do you work outside linkedin to do your networking and connecting sure Look, it's a good question. I mean, so I'll, I'll answer the first element, the first element part of your question as to how do I use LinkedIn. Yes. So there's, it has evolved over time for me, but the fundamental truth remains consistent. LinkedIn is, is to me, is a window to reflect my level of expertise in my profession. Uh, I'm not on the platform to sell anything, um, and and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what I need to be doing to earn a, earn a wage. So I specifically focus on content uh, that I believe adds value or things that I'm doing by way of work. If, it's gonna, if I share that, it's done so with the intent that my colleagues and network yeah. can, can, uh, can, can gain from it. And in terms of liking and commenting, look, some of the roles I've had have given me the good fortune of building a global network. Um, the movie industry particularly is very global, so is the cinema industry. So LinkedIn is great to just subtly connect and, and remind people that, you know, I'm watching, I'm here for you. And and these are colleagues, these are not friends. So I'm, I'm, I may or may not be connected with them on Facebook and so forth. Um, so yeah, so when, your comment about liking and commenting, that's largely, uh, you know, my way of, my small way of just encouraging people with uh, the work that they're doing, you know, and, and, uh, and just supporting it. Mm, yeah. Now, this works really well. And what you may not see it or be aware of is that by liking and commenting, mm -hmm. you're bringing people to your profile. I don't know if you've noticed that. Right, That's what no, it I does. Have, so okay. that is a very good way of enhancing your personal brand and making people aware of what you're doing, mm. especially headhunters and right. people that want to scout you for opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that good, makes sense. Good to know. You don't necessarily need to post yeah. or write articles. Mm. All mm. you need to do is like and comment. And that's what I've been telling my clients that are very busy. <laughs> yes. You don't need to post. You just need to like and comment because yeah. once you do that, you're reaching out to people that are not in your immediate audience, mm -hmm. but you're making your activities boosting the algorithm. Yeah, and that, and thank you for that. That makes complete sense. The, the second part of your question about not writing articles on LinkedIn. Look, I, I think I've, over the last few years... Because you are a writer. That's what triggered me. <laughs> I know you like to write. I do oh like God, to write. He doesn't um, write here. Well, two... two, uh, two two-part answer one writing takes a lot of time it does <laughs> uh, and unfortunately I don't have enough time with young, a young family and, and trying to juggle a job and a few other things the second part of that is I, I relish the opportunities to help content creators create content mm. so a lot of the content that you'll see that I'm a part of on LinkedIn will be forums such as this mm. so I uh, when, when the opportunities are right and they present themselves you know, I'll, I'll contribute to a podcast or another series or something along those lines. So, yeah, so by doing so, I feel like I'm fulfilling my desire to share and add value where I can without having to write yeah. uh, single-minded content from coming just from me. That's excellent. Because talking about writing, you and I have been talking about the idea of a white paper yeah. or some sort of we publication have. to put pen to paper and write about some of the ideas that you've been ruminating in your mind yes, yes. about coming to Australia at a young age and what the um, lessons that you've learned that you can pass on to mm -hmm. other generations yes. and help them establish themselves in Australia. And I'd love for you to explain to the listeners that framework that you explained to me about yeah. arriving, growing, and propelling. Can you unpack that for us? <laughs> sure. I'll also offer a little more context, if you like. Yes. So, so look, I think about a year ago, I just had a point, of, point in life where I realized I've spent more years in Australia off my life than anywhere else. And also, that happened in a moment where I was experiencing a different form of lockdown. 
unlike what we were all going through at the moment, where I'd gone through surgery and I was at home for six weeks. And, you know, it frankly, it gave me a real opportunity to look back and ponder as to what's been happening in life and take stock of things. And I decided that, you know, it was a great time to to just sort of sit back and, and start taking just taking account for the last 20 odd years and and as I started doing that what emerged was you know this sort of 10 step not a program but just these 10 steps I was able to bucket my life into 10 key learnings and steps and then I sort of and as because my this is just how my brain works then I evolved that into okay well that's 10 how do you how do you sort of build this further into a framework which is three stages in 20 years. And that was really about arrive and unlearn, grow and fail and propel being and, and learn being the, the three different phases in those 20 years, right? And and look, there's, there's I mean, I, I, won't, I don't think we have the time to go into the depth of each yes. element today, but really arrive and unlearn, the key themes really are when you, Australia is not America or the United Kingdom. It's a very unique country. It's a much smaller, it's a smaller population on a big continent. So you have to really, you know, the old saying of athletes who work harder in preseason do a lot better in season. So if you're somebody that's looking to arrive here, then you have to really prepare and do some homework beyond the obvious, which everybody does, right? Can you repeat that about the athletes? Athletes yeah. who work harder in preseason will perform better in season. Job so hunters out there, <laughs> are you listening to that? What so, have I been telling yeah. you? Plus, it's a sports analogy, it which I love, as it you is. know. It is. But <laughs> I mean, it's the same as starting a new job the, the, yes. or starting a new life. This is a new life. If you're coming to a new country, that's an element of transformation. And transformation involves change. Yeah. It involves changing every, not every element, but you will leave certain things behind. You'll take certain things forward to make room for new things to come in. You can't be the full you and keep piling more stuff on because you'll just bury yourself in it. So the arrive and unlearn element is really about, you know, truly getting a hold of doing, you know, what is Australia to you? How are you going to, you know, how, how does this cultural makeup sit with you? What elements of your physical, social and cultural self fit? which elements don't and how you transform and how you adapt and, and eventually integrate. And, you know, for the younger listeners, there's this whole aspect of, you know, I, because I wrote this going back 20 years. So the first phase is don't just graduate. Everybody can do that. And if you did that and you didn't do anything else to integrate, you are way behind even the starting line because you have no history in the country, you've got no built-in networks, and now you've just gone on and just, you know, invested another three or four years of your educational life pursuing something you and I could have done online. So why be here physically if you're not gonna build out, build your networks up and really get match day fit? You, there you go, another sports analogy, you know. You need to know how your t fellow team players are gonna play on field if you're really gonna be effective on the field. It's not just about being able to kick the ball. You need to learn the language, the vernacular, the cultural makeup of what makes a team effective and stay motivated. So these are things that you learn whilst you're studying, right? So, so that's, that's, that's the whole aspect of, and you know, and then you round yourself out by getting some part-time work, volunteering and all those things. I did all of this. So, so that really helped. Uh, so that's the arrive and unlearn piece. Grow and fail. Is, is really, I think you have to, um, my, my grandfather used to always say this, that you have to eat the frog every morning, and which basically meant you have to do something that you don't like and do it early in the day. And one of the things that I learned early in my career was I needed to sell something because, you know, we, we, sales teaches you so much about yourself. It really teaches you a lot about how people work and think but most importantly, it trains you how to handle rejection on a daily basis. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Can I stop you here and yes. give you an example? When I left the MBA at Monash, you, you know, students were very upset and I was very upset that I was leaving. So I wrote them an open letter and they, they published it. And mm. one of the things that I said is never forget what I told you about getting a job at a call center. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Right? Because people come here, and this was uh, 2008, 2009, yeah. so there were still call centers in Australia. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, this is going to teach you so much about picking up the phone and talking to people yeah. and not feeling embarrassed about selling something and about optimism and building resiliency. There's nothing better than a call center to learn oh, these things. Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, and you then you evolve because if you see it as a real building exercise, it is character building, let's be honest. Yeah. A call center job is not an easy job. No. But you evolve from handling rejection to then gradually learning how to close and that is these are cri critical life skills in every element and you know as we progress in life we realize that we're talking about job hunting you have to close you know you're there to sell yourself and if you think your CV is going to do that for you it's not and the fact that you are in an interview, your CV's done what it was going to do. It's got you through the door. That's uh, all that it needs to do. It doesn't need point, to tell your whole story of your career. It just needs to get you a call. That's correct. Yes. And at that point, you have to close. And, yes. uh, and that is selling. So, and how many people sit at a job interview and don't tell the panel mm -hmm. that they want the job? <laughs> yeah, I think in my experience, I've had only a few people truly say that they want the job. And... I remember every one of them. Mm. Whether they got the job or not is another story, but I certainly think it, it helped them. It does help. And I can tell you exactly who they were even now looking back. So that's, yeah. that's a very good point. Um, so yeah, selling something is, has been a really, really interesting aspect. And look, frankly, I've, I've now, I'm now at a point where I relish it. So most of the roles I take have a sales element to them uh, because you have to have a growth mindset okay. for the business. So. Marketing is evolving. My profession is evolving. Marketing is becoming more about how you actually drive value creation and growth for organizations. And if you don't understand sales, you, you're really not in the right place a lot of times. So, so that's, been, that's been critical. The other thing that, that a lot of us, I think, well, I certainly faced it, or I heard it, I should say, more than anything else, is when things are not going your way, a lot of people will... So uh, my heritage is Indian, right? So I, I, I would have a lot of people go, well, you know, that didn't happen for me, probably is because I'm an Indian or something along those lines. Now, that may or may not be true. You actually don't know that. But regardless of whether that's true or not, you have to slay that dragon. Otherwise, it's going to slay you for the rest of your years. Yeah. A great example that someone that I can share with you of how you can handle that is a friend of mine also uh, from a similar background lives, lives in New York. And, you know, he was living in New York. Uh, in and around September 11. And as, as you may recall, you know, when that incident occurred, there was a lot of racial unrest in New York and, and um, you know, people were being mistaken for uh, certain ethnicities and then being targeted and so forth. So I actually phoned him just to, out of concern, to see how he's going. And, you know, and, and, and he often says, you know, he's been, you know, he's, he's met a lot of idiots in his time, uh, but he's never met somebody that's maliciously racist towards him as an individual. Now that's a great mindset because what that allows him to do is two things. One, he is never blaming an entire population for one person's action. Also, he is removing himself from being the problem. So it's critical to develop a mindset that allows you to overcome these barriers should you have them if you don't have them then great go go forth and go ahead but you know we all face devils and and it's it's critical to to find ways to overcome them so that element is about growing and failing selling overcoming your own devils and and then understanding leadership here i think you know that's a real i i see that a lot in corporate australia where you know, leadership compatibility is critical as you keep growing in your career. And, and that comes, you become more effective in different markets if you have stronger depths of cultural competence. Because leading people eventually is what you're doing uh, in leadership roles, right? And that requires a deep sense of culture, individual and bespoke styles to, to, to match your various, you know, your team members and, and, and indirect reports and so forth. And, and I think that's, in some ways, I believe that I have an advantage because I have learned, transformed, studied culture to be able to pivot and adapt depending on the room I'm in. Now, 
I would encourage all your listeners to carefully pay attention to this as they are gradually evolving in their own professional journeys because also you know you're being groomed but also you're being tested at every point in time so when it comes to appointing one of four people at a certain management level to take on the next level one of the elements in that is can this person lead inspire and motivate the other 20 people and will he be able he or she be able to connect with them at an emotional level now that is critical so these are the things that go beyond your CV right so and because at some point you're going to be off the tools at some point in your journey professionally you know whether it's design or whatever and I can speak for marketing you know I, I used to love brands I used to love the element of actually for rolling my sleeves up and working on brand campaigns but as your career progresses you're playing the orchestra which is all elements of a marketing team as opposed to just working on brand so what your job becomes is really about ensuring that the brand in person the digital team and all the other various resources and the capabilities are operating in up to an, at an optimum level and that is just about getting the best out of people and that's leadership and that style varies by culture so you have to immerse yourself in Australian culture and professional culture to be able to truly affect be effective in leadership so that's that's worked for me and I, I and I don't say I have all the answers but I actively study it because I recognize that that is going to be a challenge that I have to overcome from in my own growth journey at every step along the way from this point on uh, because I'm competing not with you know I'm competing with everybody else on that table and and it's not just about um, other migrants or what have you you know at some point in your journey it's going to be just you're just here so just forget about the migrant element and just start operating like you should be which is being all in and being here and being present so that's yeah that's that's <laughs> I think I've gone too long no no that's that's great I think you've addressed all of the questions that I was going to ask you as well but one of the things that I wanted to maybe as we're going into this tail end of the interview ask you so that we can finish off yep. on, on these maybe two final questions People seek coaching when they're going through what you've just mentioned, transition from being good at a specific skill set, their superpowers yes. that they've you know, learned along the way, to moving into a role where they need to be leaders. Mm -hmm. And that transition is a big step up. And looking back, what would you say prepared you best for that leadership your first leadership role where you are you have this massive P&L you have this massive you know team and yeah. responsibilities I have to say that for me you know being a CEO taking responsibility especially in the not-for-profit sector of an endowment mm. where philanthropists and federal and state government gives you money to manage for the rest of that in perpetuity yes. <laughs> I didn't realize how scary that was until I was physically doing that job yeah you know and I you know grew that endowment so I'm very proud of that yes. but it's very lonely at the top and when you are applying for the role you, you understand the theory of it mm -hmm. but not how the role actually is in practice right yes yes of course I mean look I uh, you, you've just shared a great example I think um, for me, um, my first, you know, leadership role, I um, it took me a little while to really come to come to the realization of the scale and and, and the sense of consequence of not operating at an optimum level. Yes. But uh, one thing that I have always invested in is great relationships and mentors outside of work. And I have been fortunate to have some great leaders that have taught me and I've worked for them over the years. And, and you know, early on, that's important, you know. So my first leadership role, yeah, the CEO of the company at the time was fully invested in, in my development and was, you know, somewhat of a pseudo coach, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, that was really, really fantastic to have in the organization itself. But I have always tried to ensure that I invest in relationships that help me with my blind side 
and I have some. And as you grow, you realize what those are. So, you know, it doesn't, they're not formal mentors, but they're just colleagues or, you know, um, people and relationships that I've cultivated over the years. And we, I, I diligently catch up with these individuals and then you, you know, do the delicate dance of having the conversations that you want to have whilst yeah. making a social catch up. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and frankly, I think they do the same. So, yeah. so, you know, the old saying, if you are the company you keep is critical. So you will, as you evolve, you know, that, that element of your life should and will evolve also. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has really helped. Yeah. The final question I want to ask you is about leading people. Mm-hmm. How how do you find now you're moving into a role in Southeast Asia? Yes. Are you doing a, a different preparation for leading people in a different environment, or not? How do you approach that? What is your philosophy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, I. In January this year, I was uh, attending a dialogue in New Delhi, India, uh, representing the Australian uh, delegation of 15 people on the Australia-India bilateral dialogue. And having been away from that part of the world and Asia and Southeast Asia for so long, I think for a moment there, I actually had also forgotten that I need to re-engineer my mindset. Uh, that week was a great refresher because we spent we, we spent some conscious time unpacking the, not just the synergies, but also the differences in management and communication styles um, between different countries and cultures, right? Mm. And having worked in Australia for so long, you gradually just, you know, and, 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 and you, you just can sometimes forget that you have to constantly keep optimizing. So yeah. to answer your question, yeah, um, I, I am... I'm probably training myself as best as I can while still being in Melbourne to to change certain styles. I'm investing a lot of time speaking and listening, deliberately listening to my colleagues in Malaysia. So again, I'm in pre-season at the moment and I'm putting in the work. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Well, congratulations on your new job. We thank will, you very much. You know, be watching you and monitoring how you go <laughs> yeah, and I hope it all goes letting well. the listeners yeah. know where you where you're going when you're able to announce it and thank you so much for making the time for the podcast no my pleasure thank you for having me good thanks i hope you found this episode useful and that it helps your job hunting and career plans don't forget to subscribe and follow me on social media and on your favorite podcast app And please join the Reset Your Career community so I can send you free tools and resources to make your career advancement more successful. See you next time.